Welcome back to AP World Simplified. Today we'll be discussing the empires of China in the early modern era, including the Ming and Qing dynasty, as well as monarchical power in Western and Eastern Europe. We'll begin first with the Ming dynasty, who removed the reigning Mongol Yuan dynasty in about 1368. And the reason why we focus on this dynasty is because it's going to be the last remaining Han dynasty. Uh, while it's not the last dynasty, the last dynasty would actually be run by the Manchu people of what is now Manchuria. Uh, the Ming would, however, not only be Han, but they would see a sort of rise to fame and then slow demise um, due to their uh, failures in policies and approaches to the economy and military. Now the Ming Dynasty had a good start in that they had a large powerful navy. They inherited a uh, system of trade and, and naval trade and power that would be demonstrated by the voyages at Tseng Ha as he went into the Indian Ocean and Africa, returning with a lot of goods and exotic, exotic goods mostly, and uh, demonstrating the wealth and power of China. However, over time the Ming Dynasty would focus less and less on its navy, letting it deteriorate, and focus more and more on defense of the north. And while the uh, while a lot of funds and efforts would go to the expansion and connection of what is now known as the Great Wall of China, um, it would overall be a failure as invaders from the north would be the ones that subdue the Ming Dynasty in 1633 uh, with the Qing Dynasty. Now the Ming would suffer primarily from a domestic policy on tax collection known as the silver only tax collection. Uh, silver was needed to pay for workers and military op uh, personnel to defend the uh, territories and bolster the defenses of the North. However, by adopting a silver-only tax policy, that would mean that uh, peasants and other producers would only be producing or primarily produce goods that they got silver for in return for. So for example, the really only supply of silver at the time was not even coming from China itself, it was coming from Japan, uh, Portugal, and Spain. Uh, Portugal and Spain, of course, harnessing the silver mines of Peru, uh, Mexico, and others in the New World. And that flow of silver uh, would largely determine how they could pay their taxes. So in order to offer goods the Japanese, Portuguese, and Spanish wanted, peasants had to produce luxury goods such as silk, uh, porcelain, and tea. And these goods, while uh, initially valuable, became less and less valuable over time as more and more peasants had to create them uh, to obtain this silver. And so as it becomes a surplus of goods, the price uh, for these goods becomes lower and lower. So peasants have to make more and more goods, uh, luxury goods, to get this silver. That of course drives the price of silver even further down, meaning peasants have to create a lot and work a lot for small amounts of silver. That's going to be worsened also as the Japanese close off trade in the 17th century uh, and during an era of, of Sokoku, uh, where they pretty much halt all trade with the outside world, including China. And the Spanish are also going to crack down on the illegal transportation of silver directly from the Americas uh, to China through the Pacific, making it said that it goes through uh, Spanish ports. So the supply of silver, uh, which was already perhaps overvalued in relation to um, luxury goods, is going to be reduced even more. And that's going to leave the Ming Dynasty unable to uh, pay for projects, uh, defenses, and disasters such as famine, disease, uh, and invaders. Eventually, of course, in 1633, invaders from the north from the Manchurian region, known as the Manchu people, are going to invade and conquer the Ming Dynasty and start the Qing Dynasty. Now, while they were outnumbered 10 to 1 by the Han people, they would exert an enormous amount of power and control uh, and continue this all the way until 1911. Now, the Qing people are going to maintain the Confucian sort of model in that uh, they're going to keep the examination system going uh, and that patriarchal order, uh, largely to keep the Han population, I guess you could say, satisfied with a continuing cultural um, norm. Uh, and also, they, they really enjoyed the social order and obedience to law and authority that came along with Confucianism. However, there would be some oppressive uh, ethnic policies as the Qing are going to require all Han men to wear the uh, punishable by law and in some cases death, uh, require Han men to wear the uh, Manchu Q hairstyle, as well as banning intermarriage between Han people and um, the Manchu people of the north. Regardless, the Qing Dynasty would experience a an era of expansion, a vast expansion, uh, bringing the borders of China to the largest they had ever been, including Tibet, parts of Central Asia, and expanding more to the north. Emperors such as uh, Emperor Kangxi in the 17th century would be uh, largely responsible for this, and they would also um, invest heavily into 
art to demonstrate their sort of monarchical authority and power, much like the uh, emperors or sultans of the Ottoman Empire with their miniature paintings uh, and the princes of the Mughal Empire with uh, architectures of the Taj Mahal, the Qing would of course exert their power with these life-size portraits uh, of their emperors. Along with the increase in monarchical power in China would be a, uh, in the early modern era, would be a rise in monarchical power in Europe in the West with uh, France under Louis XIV and following in the East as well in Russia with uh, Peter the Great. Now these monarchs are going to cling to a, a sort of new idea or doctrine known as the Divine Right of Kings, which holds that all peoples, including the nobles, which had traditionally fought with them for power, obeying them sometimes, sometimes not obeying them, they should obey not only uh, because of the secular authorities, i.e. that the king and the army might punish them, but also that uh, the authority of, of the Christian God had placed them there. So because the Christian God had placed them at the top, uh, they were chosen by God, essentially. So disobeying the king not only was disobeying the king, but disobeying God. So not only were there secular punishments for disobeying the king, but perhaps punishments in the next life uh, for disobeying the authority of God. Additionally, starting with Louis XIV in France and spreading also to uh, Peter the Great in Russia would be this um, greater control over the nobility. Not so much through force, although Peter the Great certainly used force to control the nobles. Uh, it would be more so by including them in the central government and actually benefiting the nobles. So rather than struggle with the nobles over power of their local kingdoms, Louis XIV would allow those, those noblemen, those lords, to actually keep their local power in their local area. However, he would expand their power by moving them to the capital and including them in the central government and military. So bureaucratic positions, for example, uh, or military officer positions were granted to these noblemen, increasing their prestige uh, and power and really encouraging them to participate um, and function under the rule of uh, Louis XIV and his advisors. They would also mimic that sort of setup in um, Prussia and, and even in Russia under Peter the Great. In addition to that, they're going to demonstrate their monarchical power, much as like the other leaders with their miniature life-size and life-size paintings as well as monuments, construct large palaces such as the Palace of Versailles in France as, as well as the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg um, in Russia. These, of course, are going to demonstrate the monarchical power and their control uh, within the their uh, kingdoms. Now, while much more could be said about monarchs and empires in the early modern era, however, if you would like more videos on the early modern era or other resources from any of the other periods in AP World, feel free to visit my website at morganapteaching.com for lots of tools and resources for AP students and teachers. Thank you for watching.